Now what I need to do in this session is define three words, theology, philosophy, and philosophical theology. And let me begin with the word theology. What exactly is theology? Well, it is clear that Christians believe a lot of things, and we usually call them doctrines. And they are doctrines about God, about Christ, about human beings, about the world, and about the future, and lots of other things as well. Theology is simply the attempt to think clearly and methodically about the doctrines that we Christians believe were revealed to us by God. Now, of course, there are professional theologians. They are usually people who have a PhD in theology and teach at a theological seminary or university or a college somewhere. But Eric and I believe that all Christians are theologians because all Christians at one time or another ask questions or wonder about various things like God and Christ and the world and humanity and the future. Now theology, as you probably know, is an argumentative discipline. That is to say, in theolo theology, there are a lot of disagreements among theologians. And there are Catholic beliefs and Protestant beliefs and Eastern Orthodox beliefs. And there are also different denominations among the Protestants. There are Episcopalians and Baptists and, and, the, and uh, Pentecostals. And so there are lots of different disagreements in theology. But Eric and I bo both believe that there are certain core doctrines that all Christians believe or ought to believe. And they are doctrines, again, about God, about the Trinity, about Christ, about the Incarnation, about the resurrection of Jesus, and about our reconciliation to God through the Atonement. Theology has a lot of different branches. There are different divisions of theology, and we see them taught at various theological seminaries. And let me mention a bunch of them and try to define them very briefly. Systematic theology is simply the attempt, as it sounds, to think systematically and carefully and coherently about the things we believe. Systematic theologians try to make sure that the various doctrines we believe are internally coherent and are consistent with other things that we believe so that Christianity, in terms of Christian theology especially, comes out to be a coherent worldview. Biblical theology is the attempt to get clear on biblical doctrines, what things are taught in the Bible, and especially specific parts of the Bible. I mean, somebody might want to write about Pauline theology, or even about what Paul says in Romans about a particular topic, the righteousness of God, or something else. Somebody else want to write, might want to write about the theology of Deuteronomy. But biblical theology is to get, attempt to get clear on the what the different theological writers, different biblical writers were talking about and wanted to say. A very important branch of theology is called historical theology. That is the attempt to understand what various theologians throughout the history of the Christian church have said about theology and what is said in various creeds as well. We think anybody who wants to do theology in a serious way needs to, do at least some, needs to know at least something about historical theology. Another branch of theology is called natural theology. Natural theology is the attempt to learn as much as we can about God and the world just by using human reason alone. That is to say, without the benefit of any special or supernatural revelation from God. Thomas Aquinas, maybe the greatest theologian who ever was, a natural theologian who ever was, thought that there are certain things that we can learn by human reason alone. One of them is the existence of God. But he thought he was clear on the fact that there are certain other things like uh, Christian teachings, like the Trinity, that we can only learn by revelation. But natural theology is the attempt to learn what we can just by human reason alone. And the scriptures seem to teach in the Psalms and in Romans chapter 1, there are at least some things, and other places as well, there are at least some things that we can learn by human reason alone. Moral theology, as it sounds, is the attempt to get clear on which, what Christian teachings are about how we ought to behave as human beings and what societies and cultures and even nations ought to do. Pastoral theology is the attempt to help human beings make it through life especially in terms of the problems that they face, and especially in terms of suffering people. And finally, apologetics 
is the attempt to defend Christian faith. Apologia in Greek means defense. And apologetics does that in two ways. In one way, uh, the first way, it attempts to answer criticisms of Christianity that are given by critics of Christianity. And the other is the apologetics attempts to give positive arguments in favor of Christian beliefs. Now that's a very quick and sketchy introduction to what theology is. So let me move on to the question, what is philosophy? Now, um, philosophy uh, is, a, is a term that philosophers themselves disagree about, they disagree about how to define it precisely in any case. But interestingly, there is widespread agreement among philosophers about who the great philosophers were and what the topics are that philosophers should investigate. But at any rate, our answer, the answer that Eric and I give to the question, what is philosophy, is that philosophy is the attempt to answer ultimate questions. Now, what is an ultimate question? Well, a question has to satisfy two criteria to be an ultimate question. First is, it has to be a question that people are deeply interested in answering. And second, it has to be a question that cannot be answered by the methods of science. For example, let's take the question, was Julius Caesar right-handed or left-handed? Now, that is a question that nobody is interested in answering. Maybe there's somebody who's doing a doctoral dissertation on Roman history and wants to know the answer to that. But in general, nobody's strictly interested in whether Julius Caesar was right-handed or left-handed. On the other hand, there are certain questions that keep appearing in human cultures and civilizations through the centuries that it's obvious that people really want to answer if they possibly can. Let's pick another question. Is there life on Mars? I know that that's a question that satisfies the first criterion because every time we send a probe to Mars and it ends up being successful and there's a press conference at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, the very first question that the scientists get asked by the reporters is, well, did you discover any evidence that there is or ever was life on Mars or anywhere else in the solar system? So that's a question that, that uh, people are deeply interested in answering. But the thing is, it is a question that can be satisfied, can be, can be answered by the methods of science. We don't now know whether there is or ever was life on Mars. We've got some hints. But we can imagine doing a thorough investigation of the planet Mars and discovering that there was life on Mars, or maybe even there is life on Mars, or that there is no evidence that there is any life on Mars. So that's a question that's not a philosophical or ultimate question either, because it can be answered by the methods of science. Now, what are some questions that are ultimate questions? Well, one is the question, will I live after I die? In other words, after I die, will I go on being the human I am as a conscious individual? It doesn't seem to me that science can answer that question. There's no experiment we can conduct in a physics lab or a biology lab to answer it. There's no num set of numbers we can crunch to find the answer. There's no poll we can take. How many people in the citizens of, uh, of, citizens of uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan believe in life after death? I mean, that won't answer the question either. And it obviously is a question that people are very deeply interested in answering. So that, will I live after I die, that is an ultimate question or a philosophical question. Another one would be, what is the meaning of life? Um, why am I here? And uh, how do I live the good life? Um, and obviously it seems like that's a question that people really want to know the answer to, but we can't answer it in any of those methods that we've determined that science uses. Does God exist? That's another one. Some people think that we can prove that God exists. Thomas Aquinas actually thought that, but a lot of other people think we can't prove that God exists or prove that God doesn't exist. And people, almost everybody, even most atheists, really would like to know whether God exists, and so that's an ultimate question. Do we have free will? Or is everything we do and believe and say determined or made necessary by past events, the causes working on us. These kinds of ultimate questions do keep reappearing in human experience and in human history. But again, it seems like there's nothing we can do to come up with a definitive answer 
to these sorts of questions. What this means is that the discipline called philosophy is both frustrating and fascinating. It's fascinating because these are questions that people would really like to know the answer to. And it's frustrating because there are no easy answers to philosophical questions. Here's a kind of simple-minded way to distinguish philosophy from science. Science you can understand as growing like building blocks. I mean, a certain scientist makes a certain experiment and suggests a certain hypothesis and then claims that the hypothesis has been proved by experience and that other scientists conduct the same experiment and reach the conclusion and pretty soon it's, uh, that discovery has been accepted by the scientific community. And then on the basis of that discovery, other scientists can make other discoveries. Philosophy does not work that way. In philosophy, we keep, keep asking the same questions that Plato and Aristotle asked, and Kant and Hegel and many other great philosophers. We keep going back to our past, and philosophy then does not grow like building blocks. On the other hand, philosophy does seem to many people, even people who maybe have taken a class called Introduction to Philosophy, does seem to be kind of vague and speculative, and I think Eric and I have to admit that sometimes it is that. But we think philosophy at heart should be down to earth and realistic and even helpful because it helps people answer the questions that they would really like to answer. We think, just like we said before, that everybody, every Christian is a theologian, we think everybody is a philosopher because everybody asks philosophical questions at one time or another. Of course, in philosophy, we have to recognize our intellectual limitations. We have to recognize there are some things we know and some things we don't know. But in philosophy, we try to develop certain intellectual virtues, and philosophy can help people develop those virtues. One is a kind of intellectual humility, not just thinking that because you have a certain idea or a certain opinion that it's got to be true and everybody else is definitely wrong. And this goes along with a kind of intellectual open-mindedness, being willing to listen to other points of view, and even being willing to listen to criticisms that other people honestly have of your point of view. Philosophy can also help us avoid intellectual carelessness. That is to say, we think a lot of uh, thinking is characterized by a kind of sloppiness, and philosophy can help you develop the intellectual carefulness that you need. It can also develop a kind of autonomy in the sense that you don't accept something that somebody else says just on the authority of that somebody else. Of course, sometimes other people know more than we do and we accept pretty much what they say and that's fine, but you don't accept something just because somebody else says it. Now, third question, what is philosophical theology or Christian philosophical theology? I need to point out that the relationship between theology and philosophy is a complicated one throughout the history of Christian theology. Some people have thought that philosophy is, an, is or ought to be an ally of Christian theology. Other people have thought that it's an enemy. Um, there are certain similarities and certain differences. Some of the similarities are, well, first of all, that both philosophers and theologians look to the past. They look to past practitioners of philosophy and theology, study them seriously, and studying them makes up a great part of what philosophy and theology constitutes. Furthermore, both philosophy and theology uh, strive for connected, consistent, coherent teaching. But there are some certain really big differences. Here's probably the biggest of them. In philosophy, we accept nothing on authority. Of course, some philosophers will accept something, some opinion or theory or belief because a professor said it or somebody they, they respect said it in a book or something. I mean, that does sometimes happen. But philosophy as a discipline accept no, accepts nothing on authority. It accepts a given claim or theory only if the evidence in favor of that theory looks to be strong and powerful and the evidence against it seems to be weak. On the other hand, theology is very different. In Christian theology, we do accept certain things on authority. For example, if there is something that scripture, 
when correctly interpreted, clearly teaches, it is an obligation of all Christians to accept that claim. And that is what Christian theologians do, or certainly ought to do. And so that is the single biggest difference between philosophy and theology. Now then, what is philosophical theology? It is simply the attempt to use the methodologies and conceptual resources of philosophy and apply them to theological issues. What it does, it tests certain theological claims for their intelligibility, whether they even make sense, for their consistency, whether they're coherent with each other. And it leads, we think, to a deeper understanding of Christian teachings. So philosophical theology, we think, has a lot of value um, for, for the Christian world. One is, it helps us to achieve clarity in what we say and what we write, and avoid obfuscation. Obfuscation is writing in a confusing way. Most of the time, people who obfuscate, I think, don't really mean to, although I have read certain writings that seem to me that the, the author was trying to confuse issues. But nevertheless, in ph philosophical theology, we try to achieve clarity and avoid obfuscation. We also try to make carefully distinct, careful distinctions. We also try to provide logical consistency and intelligibility. And maybe most of all, in philosophical theology, we try to be biblically faithful. One of the things that motivates Eric and me to do these sessions is that we think there are too many Christians out there in the world today who hold problematical opinions. For example, both of us know about a certain uh, theologian who wrote, a, wrote an article on the Trinity where he ended up saying that the Trinity means that the number three equals the number one. That is wrong, and no Christian should go there. I think there are a lot of Christians today who believe something like this. Anything you want to believe is okay as long as you're sincere. Um, that is wrong, and no Christian should believe that. I think there are Christians out there today who believe something like this. Any Christian who is suffering from disease is not praying hard enough or is not a good enough Christian. That is wrong, and no Christian should believe that. There are also Christians who believe, Eric and I have both encountered people like this, who think that after we die, we will live forever with God. That part is true. Without our bodies. Our bodies will rot away permanently in the ground and we'll be together with God there as our souls. That is wrong, and no Christian should believe that. The Christian teaching is that Christ himself is at the right hand of God the Father in his resurrection body, and we too will be raised in a resurrection body to be with God. Now, obviously, there is more to thinking and speaking about God than just logic and philosophy, but we think those disciplines can help us to avoid sloppy thinking, and be better Christian thinkers. We think philosophical theologians have a lot to contribute, and we commend that to you, that discipline to you, although we recognize we need to learn, philosophical theologians need to learn from other theologians and even from pastors and church leaders.